The Way of a Maid by Frances Thompson Read for LibriVox.org by Eliza Swan The lover whose soul shaken is In some decuman billow of bliss Who feels his gradual wading feet Sink in some sudden hollow of sweet And mid love's used converse comes Sharp on a mood which all joy sums An instant fine compendium of the liberal levered writ of love his abashed pulses beating thick at the exigent joy and quick is dumbed by aiming utterance great up to the miracle of his fate the wise girl such icarian fall saved by her confidence that she's small as what no kindred word will fit is uttered best by opposite love in the tongue of hate expressed and deepest anguish in a jest feeling the infinite must be best said by triviality speak where expression baits its wings just happy alien little things what of all words is in excess implies in a sweet nothingness with dayless babble shows her sense that full speech were full impotence and while she feels the heavens lie bare she only talks about her hair End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ode to the Setting Sun by Francis Thompson Read for LibriVox.org by Philip Gould Prelude The wailful sweetness of the violin floats down the hushed waters of the wind. The heart-strings of the throbbing harp begin to long in aching music. Spirit pined in wafts that poignant sweetness drifts until the wounded soul ooze sadness. The red sun, a bubble of fire, drops slowly toward the hill while one bird prattles that the day is done. O setting sun, that as in reverent days sinkest in music to thy smoothed sleep, discrowned of homage, though yet crowned with rays, him not at harvest more, though reapers reap. For thee this music wakes not. O oh, deceived, if thou hear in these thoughtless harmonies a pious phantom of adorings reaved, and echo of fair ancient flatteries. Yet in this field where the cross planted reigns, I know not what strange passion bows my head to thee, whose great command upon my veins proves thee a god for me not dead, not dead. For worship it is too incredulous. For doubt, O oh, too believing passionate, What wild divinity makes my heart thus a fount of most baptismal tears? Thy straight long beam lies steady on the cross. Ah, me! What secret would thy radiant finger show? Of thy bright mastership, is this the key? Is this thy secret, then? And is it woe? Fling from thine ear the burning curls, and hark, A song thou hast not heard in northern day, For Rome too daring, and for Greece too dark, Sweet with wild wings that pass, that pass away. Ode Alpha and Omega, sadness and mirth, The springing music in its wasted breath, The fairest things in life are death and birth, And of these two the fairer thing is death, Mystical twins of time inseparable, The younger hath the holier array, And hath the awfuler sway. It is the falling star that trails the light, It is the breaking wave that hath the might, The passing shower that rainbows maniple. Is it not so, O thou down-stricken day, That drawest thy splendors round thee in thy fall? High was thine eastern pomp inaugural, but thou dost set in statelier pageantry lauded with tumults of a firmament thy visible music blasts make deaf the sky thy cymbals clang to fire the occident thou dost thy dying so triumphantly i see the crimson blurring of thy shrams why do these lucent palms strow thy feet's failing thicklier than their might who dost but hood thy glorious eyes with night and vex the heels of all the yesterdays Lo, this loud lackeying praise will stay behind to greet the usurping moon when they have cloud-barred over thee the west. 
O oh, shake the bright dust from thy parting shoon. The earth not peons thee, nor serves thy hest, Be godded not by heaven. Avert thy face, and leave to blank disgrace The oblivious world, unsceptre thee of state and place. Yet ere Olympus thou wast, and a god, Though we deny thy nod, we cannot spoil thee of thy divinity. What know we elder than thee? When thou didst, bursting from the great void's husk, Leap like a lion on the throat of the dusk, When the angels rose chapleted, sang to each other, The vaulted blaze overhead of their vast pinion spread, Hailing thee, brother. How chaos rolled back from the wonder, And the first morn knelt down to thy visage of thunder. Thou didst draw to thy side thy young auroral bride, And lift her veil of night and mystery. Tell us with baby hands shook off her swaddling bands, And from the unswathed vapors laughed to thee. Thou twiform deity, nurse at once, and sire, Thou genitor that all things nourishest. The earth was suckled at thy shining breast, And in her veins is quick thy milky fire. Who scarfed her with the morning? And who set upon her brow the day-fall's carcanet? Who queened her front with the enrondered moon? Who dug night's jewels from their vaulty mind to dower her, Past an eastern wizard's dreams, When hovering on him through his hashy swoon, All the rain-gems of the old Tartarian line Shiver in lustrous throbbings of tinged flame, Whereof a moiety in the Paoli seems Stately builded their Venetian name, Thou hast enwoofed her, an empress of the air, And all her births are propertied by thee. Her teeming centuries drew being from thine eyes, Thou fatst the marrow of all quality. Who lit the furnace of the mammoth's heart? Who shagged him like Pilatus' ribbed flanks? Who raised the column ranks of that old pre-diluvian forestry, Which like a continent torn oppressed the sea? When the ancient heavens did in rains depart, While the high-danced whirls of the tossed scud Made hiss thy drenched curls, Thou rearest the enormous brood, Who hast with life imbued the lion maned in tawny majesty, The tiger velvet barred, The stealthy stepping pard, And the lithe panther's flexuous symmetry. How came the entombed tree a light-bearer, Though sunk in lightless lair? Friend of the forges of earth, made of the earthquake and thunders volcanic, Clasped in the arms of the forces titanic which rock like a cradle The girth of the ether-hung world. Swart son of the swarthy mine, when flame on the breath of his nostrils feeds, How is his countenance half divine like thee, in thy sanguine weeds? Thou gavest him his light, though sepulchred in night beneath the dead bones of a perished world. Over his prostrate form, though cold and heat and storm, The mountainous rack of a creation hurled. Who made the splendid rose saturate with purple glows, Cup to the marge with beauty, a perfume press, Whence the wind vintages gushes of warmed fragrance, Richer far than all the flavorous ooze of cypress vats. Lo, in yon gale which waves her green cymar With dusky cheeks burnt red, she sways her heavy head, Drunk with the must of her own odorousness, While in emoted trouble the vexed gnats maze And vibrate and tease the noontide hush. Who girt dissolved lightnings in the grape, Summered the opal with an irised flush? Is it not thou that dost the tulip drape, And hewest the daffodilly? Yet who has snowed the lily? And her frail sister whom the waters name Dust vestal vesture mid the blaze of June, Cold as the new-sprung girlhood of the moon, Ere autumn's kiss sultry her cheek with flame. Thou swayest thy sceptred beam o'er all delight, and dream. Beauty is beautiful but in thy glance, And, like a jocund maid in garland flowers arrayed, Before thy ark earth keeps her sacred dance. And now, O oh, shaken from thine antique throne, And sunken from thy co-rule empery, now that the red glare of thy fall is blown in smoke and flame about the windy sky, where are the wailing voices that should meet from hill, stream, grove, and all of mortal shape, who tread thy gifts and vineyards as stray feet pulp the globed weight of juiced Iberia's grape? Where is the threne of the sea, and why not dirges thee the wind, 
that sings to himself as he makes stride lonely and terrible on the Andean height. Where is the naiad mid her sordid sedge, the nymph wan glimmering by her wan founts verge? The dryad at timid gaze by the woodside, the oread jutting light on one upstrained soul from the rock ledge. The nereid tiptoe upon the scud or the surge with whistling tresses dank athwart her face and all her figure poised in lithe Circean grace. Why withers their lament, their tresses tear besprent? Have they sighed hence with trailing garment him? O oh, sweet, O oh, sad, O oh, fair, I catch your flying hair, draw your eyes down to me and dream on them. A space and they flee from me. Must ye fade, O oh, old essential candors, ye who made the earth a living and a radiant thing, and leave her corpse in our strained, cheated arms? Lo, ever thus, when song with corded charms draws from dull death his lost Eurydice, lo, ever thus, even at consummating, even in the swooning minute that claims her his, even as he trembles to the impassioned kiss of reincarnate beauty, his control clasps the cold body and forgoes the soul. What so looks lovelily is but the rainbow on life's weeping rain. Why have we longings of immortal pain and all we long for mortal? Woe is me, and all our chance but chapped of some decay, as mine this vanishing, nay, vanished, day. The low skyline dusks to a leaden hue, no rift disturbs the heavy shade and chill, save one where the charred firmament lets through the scorching dazzle of heaven gainst which the hill, outflattened somberly, stands black as life against eternity. Against eternity? A rifting light in me burns through the leaden broodings of the mind. O blessed sun, thy state uprisen or derogate dafts me no more with doubt. I seek and find. If, with exultant tread, thou foot the eastern sea, or like a golden bee sting the west to angry red, thou dost image, thou dost follow that kingmaker of creation, who, ere Hellas hailed Apollo, gave thee, angel god, thy station. Thou art of him a type memorial, like him thou hangst in dreadful pomp of blood upon thy western rood, and his stained brow did veil like thine to-night, yet lift once more its light, and risen, again departed from our ball. But when it set on earth arose in heaven, thus hath he unto death his beauty given. And so of all which form inheriteth the fall doth pass the rise in worth, for birth hath in itself the germ of death, but death hath in itself the germ of birth. It is the falling acorn buds the tree, the falling rain that bears the greenery, the fern plants moulder when the ferns arise, for there is nothing lives but something dies, and there is nothing dies but something lives, till skies be fugitives, till time, the hidden root of change, up dries, are birth and death inseparable on earth, for they are twain yet one, and death is birth. After strain. Now with one ray that other sun of song sets in the bleakening waters of my soul. One step and lo, the cross stands gaunt and long twixt me and yet bright skies a presage dole. Even so, O cross, thine is the victory. Thy roots are fast within our fairest fields. Brightness may emanate in heaven from thee. Here thy dread symbol only shadow yields. Of reaped joys thou art the heavy sheaf, which must be lifted, though the reaper groan. Yea, we may cry till heaven's great ear be deaf, but we must bear thee, and must bear alone. Vain were a Simon of the Antipodes, our night not borrows the superfluous day. Yet woe to him that from his burden flees, crushed in the fall of what he cast away. Therefore, O tender lady, Queen Mary, thou gentleness that dust in moss and drape the cross's rigorous austerity, wipe thou the blood from wounds that needs must gape. Lo, though suns rise and set, but crosses stay, I leave thee ever, saith she, light of cheer. Tis so. Yon sky still thinks upon the day and showers aerial blossoms on his bier. Yon cloud with wrinkled fire is edged sharp and once more welling through the air, 
ah me how the sweet viol plains him to the harp whose panged sobbings throng tumultuously oh this medusa pleasure with her stings this essence of all suffering which is joy i am not thankless for the spell it brings though tears must be told down for the charmed toy no while soul sky and music bleed together let me give thanks even for those griefs in me the restless windward stirrings of whose feather prove them the brood of immortality my soul is quitted of death neighboring swoon who shall not slake her immitigable scars until she hear my sister from the moon and take the kindred kisses of the stars end of poem this recording is in the public domain Epilogue to a Judgment in Heaven by Francis Thompson Read for LibriVox.org by Philip Gould Virtue may unlock hell, or even ascend turn in the wards of heaven, as ethics of the textbook go. So little men their own deeds know, or through the intricate melee guess whitherward draws the battle sway. So little if they know the deed discern what therefrom shall succeed to wisest moralists tis but given to work rough border law of heaven within this narrow life of ours these marches twixt delimitless powers is it if heaven the future showed is it the all-severest mode to see ourselves with the eyes of god god rather grant at his assize he see us not with our own eyes heaven which man's generations draws nor deviates into replicas must of his deep diversity in judgment as creation be there is no expeditious road to pack and label men for god and save them by the barrel load some may perchance with strange surprise have blundered into paradise in vasty dusk of life abroad they fondly thought to err from god nor knew the circle that they trod and wandering all the night about found them at morn where they set out death dawned heaven lay in prospect wide lo they were standing by his side end of poem this recording is in the public domain grace of the way by francis thompson recorded for LibriVox.org by jude the windy trammel of her dress, her blown locks took my soul in mesh. God's breath they spake with visibleness that stirred the raiment of her flesh. And sensible as her blown locks were, beyond the precincts of her form, I felt the woman flow from her, a calm of intempestuous storm. I failed against the affluent tide out of this abject earth of me i was translated and enskied into the heavenly region she now of that vision i bereven this knowledge keep that may not dim short arm needs man to reach to heaven so ready is heaven to stoop to him which sets to measure of man's feet no alien tree for trysting place and who can read may read the sweet direction in his lady's face end of poem this recording is in the public domain to a snowflake by francis thompson recorded for LibriVox.org by jude what heart could have thought you past our devisal o filigree petal fashioned so purely fragilely surely from what paradisal imagineless metal too costly for cost who hammered you wrought you from argentine vapour god was my shaper passing surmisal he hammered he wrought me from curled silver vapour to lust of his mind thou couldst not have thought me so purely so palely tinnily surely mightily frailly insculted and embossed with his hammer of wind and his graver of frost 
End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Orient Ode by Francis Thompson, read for LibriVox.org by Gauguin on March 28, 2018, in Philadelphia. Orient Ode Lo, in the sanctuaried east, day, a dedicated priest in all his robes pontifical expressed, lifteth slowly, lifteth sweetly, from out its orient tabernacle drawn, yon orbit sacrament confessed, which sprinkles benediction through the dawn. And when the grave procession ceased, the earth with due illustrious rite, blessed, ere the frail fingers featly of twilight violet cassocked acolyte, his sacerdotal stoles unvest, sets for high close of the mysterious feast, the sun in August exposition meetly within the flaming monstrance of the West. God, whom none may live in mark, born within thy radiant ark, by the earth a joyous David dances before thee from the dawn to dark. The moon, O leaf, pale, ruined eve, behold her fair and greater daughter, offers to thee her fruitful water, which at thy first white ave shall conceive. Thy gazes do on simple her, desirable allures confer, what happy comelinesses rise beneath thy beautifying eyes! Who was, indeed, at first a maid, such as, with sighs, misgives she is not fair, and secret views herself afraid, till flatteries sweet provoke the charms they swear? Yea, thy gaze's blissful lover, make the beauties they discover. What dainty guiles and treacherous court, from artful prompting of love's artless thought, her lowly loveliness teach her to adorn, when thy plumes shiver against the conscious gates of morn. And so the love, which is thy dower, earth, though her first frightened breast, against the exigent boon protest, for she, poor maid, of her own power, has nothing in herself, not even love, but an unwitting void thereof, gives back to thee in sanctities of flower, and holy odours do her bosom invest, that sweeter grows for being pressed, though dear recoil the tremorous nurse of joy, from thine embrace still startles coy, till phosphorlet at thy returning hour, the laughing captive from the wishing west. Nor the majestic heavens less, thy formidable sweets approve, thy dreads and thy delights confess, that do draw and that remove. Thou, as a lion's roarest, O sun, upon thy satellite's vexed heels, before thy terrible hunt thy planets run, each in his frighted orbit wheels, each flies through inassuageable chase, since the hunt o'er the world begun, the puissant approaches of thy face, and yet thy radiant leash he feels, since the hunt o'er the world begun, lashed with terror, leashed with longing, the mighty course is ever run, pricked with terror, leashed with longing, thy reign they love, and thy rebuke they shun, since the hunt of the world began, with love that trembleth, fear that loveth, though joins the woman to the man, and life with death, in obscure nuptials moveth comingly alien yet affinite breath. Thou art the incarnated light, whose sire is aboriginal and beyond death and resurgence of our day and night. From him is thy vicegerent wand, with double potence of the black and white. Giver of love and beauty and desire, the terror and the loveliness of and purging, the deathfulness and lifefulness of fire. Samson's riddling meanings merging in thy twofold sceptre meet, out of thy minatory might, burning line, burning line, comes the honey of all sweet, and out of thee, the eater, comes forth meat. And thou, by thine alternate breath, every kiss thou dost inspire, echoeth. Back from the windy voltages of death, yet thy clear warranty above, Ogos, the wings of death too must, 
occult reverberation stir of love crescent and life incredible that even the kisses of the just go down not unresurgent to the dust yea not a kiss which i have given but shall triumph upon my lips in heaven or cling a shameful fungus there in hell knowst thou me not o son yea well thou knowest the ancient miracle the children knowest of zeus and may and still thou teachest them o splendent brother to incarnate the antique way the truth which is their heritage from their sire in sweet disguise of flesh from their sweet mother my fingers thou hast taught to con thy flame chordered saltirion till i can translate into mortal wire till i can translate passing well the heavenly harping harmony melodious sealed inaudible which makes the dulcet psalter of the world's desire thou whisperest in the moon's white ear and she does whisper into mine by night together i and she with her virgin voice divine the things i cannot half so sweetly tell as she can sweetly speak i sweetly hear by her the woman does earth live o lord yet she for earth and both in thee light out of light resplendent and prevailing word of the unheard not unto thee great image not to thee did the wise heathen bend an idle knee and in an age of faith grown frore if i too shall adore be it accounted unto me a bright sciential idolatry god has given thee visible thunders to utter thine apocalypse of wonders and what want i of prophecy that at the sounding from thy station of thy flagrant trumpet see the seals that melt the open revelation or who a god persuading angel needs that only heeds the rhetoric of thy burning deeds which but to sing if it may be in worship warranting moiety so i would win in such a song as hath within a smouldering core of mystery brimmed with nimbler meanings up than hasty gideons in their hands may sup lo my suit pleads that thou a sign coal of fire touch from yon altar my poor mouth's desire and the reluctant song take for thy sacred meats to thine own shape thou rounds the chrysolite of the grape binds thy gold lightnings in his veins thou storest the white garners of the rains destroyer and beserver thou who medicinest sickness and to health art the unthanked marrow of its wealth to those apparent sovereignties we bow and bright appurtenances of thy brow thy proper blood dost thou not give that earth the gust demeanoured drink and dance art thou not life of them that live yea in glad twinkling advent thou dost dwell within our body as a tabernacle thou bittest with thine ordinance the jaws of time and thou dost meet the unsustainable treading of his feet thou to thy spousal universe art husband she thy wife and church who in most dusk and vigil curch her lord being hence keeps her cold sorrows by thy hearse the heavens renew their innocence and morning state but by thy sacrament communicate the weeping night the symbol of our prayers our darkened search and sinful vigil desolate yea bune and imploring dumb essential heavens and corporal earth await the spirit and the bride say come lo of thy magens i the least haste with my gold my incenses and mirth to thy desired epiphany from the spiced regions and odours of songs traded east thou for the life of all that live the victim daily born and sacrificed to whom the pinion of this longing verse beats but with fire which first thyself did give to thee o son or is it perchance to christ ay 
If men say that on all high heaven's face the saintly signs I trace, which round my stolid altars hold their solemn place, Amen, Amen. For, oh, how could it be, when I with winged feet had run through all the windy earth about, quested its secret of the sun, and heard what thing the stars together shout, I should not heed thereout, consenting counsel one. By this, O singer, know we if thou see. When man shall say to thee, Lo, Christ is here. When man shall say to thee, Lo, Christ is there, believe them, yea, and this, then art thou seer, when all thy crying clear is but, Lo here, lo there, ah me, lo everywhere. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. From From the Night of Four Being by Francis Thompson. Read for LibriVox.org by Gauguin. April 28 in Philadelphia. An Ode After Easter. Cast wide the folding doorways of the east, for now is light increased, and the wind besom chambers of the air, see they be garnished fair, and look the ways exhale some precious odours, and set ye all about wild breathing spies, most fit for paradise. Now is no time for sober gravity, season enough has nature to be wise, but now distinct with raiment glittering free, shake she the ringing rafters of the skies with festal footing and bold joy and sweet and let the earth be drunken and carouse for lo into her house spring is come home with her world wandering feet and all things are made young with young desires and all for her is light increased in yellow stars and yellow daffodils and east to west and west to east Fling answering welcome fires by dawn and dayfall on the jocund hills. And ye, winged minstrels of her fair mani, being newly coated in glad livery, upon her steps attend, and round her treading dance and without end, reel your shrill lutany. What popular breath her coming does out tell the garrulous leaves among? What little noises stir and pass from blade to blade along the voluble grass, O nature, never done ungaped at Pentecostal miracle, we hear thee, each man in his proper tongue. Break, elemental children, break ye loose from the strict frosty rule of greybeard winter school. Vault, O young wines, vault in your tricksome courses, Upon the snowy steeds that rainless use in carule pampas of the heaven to run, fold of the white sea horses, washed in the lambent waters of the sun. Let even the slug aped snail upon the thorn put forth a conscious horn. Mine elemental co mates joy each one, and ah, my foster brethren seem not sad, no, seem not sad that my strange heart and I should be so little glad. Suffer me at your leafy feast to sit apart, a somewhat alien guest, and watch your mirth, unsharing in the liberal laugh of earth, yet with a sympathy, begot of wholly sad and half-sweet memory, the little sweetness making grief complete, faint wind of wings from hours that distant beat, when I, I too, was once, O wild companions, as are you, ran with such wilful feet. Hark to the jubilate of the bird, for them that found the dying way to life. And they have heard, and quickened to the great precursive word, green spray showers lightly down the cascade of the larch. The graves are riven, and the sun comes with power amid the clouds of heaven. Before his way went forth the trumpet of the march, Before his way, before his way, Dances the pennon of the May. O earth, unchilded widowed earth, So long lifting in patient pine and ivy tree, Mournful belief and steadfast prophecy, Behold how all things are made true, Behold your bridegroom cometh in to you, Exceeding glad and strong. Raise up your eyes, 
O oh, raise your eyes abroad. No more shall you sit soul and vidual, searching in servile pall. Upon the hieratic night the star-sealed sense of all. Rejoice, O oh, barren, and look forth abroad. Your children gathered back to your embrace, see with a mother's face. Look up, O oh, mortals, and the portent heed in every deed washed with new fire to their irradiant birth reintegrated are the heavens and earth from sky to sod the world's unfolded blossom smells of god my little world itself the shadows pass in this thy sister world as in a glass of all processions that revolve in thee not only of cyclic man thou here discernst the plan not only of cyclic man, but of the cyclic me. Not solely of mortality's great years, the reflex just appears, but thine own bosom's year, still circling round in ample and in ampler gyre, toward the far completion, wherewith crowned, love unconsumed shall chant in his own furnace fire. How many trampled and deciduous joys enrich thy soul for joys deciduous still, before the distance shall fulfill cyclic unrest with solemn equipoise? Happiness is the shadow of things past, which fools still take for that which is to be. And not all foolishly, for all the past read true is prophecy, and all the firsts are hauntings of some last and all the springs are flashlights of one spring. Then leaf and flower and fall less fruit shall hang together on the unyellowing bough, and silence shall be music mute. For her surcharged heart, hush thou, these things are far too sure that thou shouldst dream thereof, lest they appear as things that seem. Nature enough within thy glass too many and too stern the shadows pass in this delighted season flaming for thy resurrection feast ah more i think the long and sepulchre cold than stony winter rolled from the unsealed mouth of the holy east the snowdrop saintly stoles less heed than the snow cloistered penance of the seed tis the weak flesh reclaiming against the ordinance which yet for just the accepting spirit scans. Earth waits, and patient heaven, self-bonded God doth wait, thrice promulgated bands of his fair nuptial date. And power is man's, with that great word of wait, to still the sea of tears, and shake the iron heart of fate. In that one word is strong, and else, alas, much mortal song with sight to pass the frontier of all spheres, and voice which does my sight such wrong. Not without fortitude I wait, the dark majestical ensuit of destiny, nor peevish raid, calm knowledged fate, I do hear from the revolving year a voice which cries, All dies, lo, how all dies, O seer, and all things too arise, all dies, and all is born, but each resurgent morn behold more near the perfect morn. Firm is the man, and set beyond the cast of fortune's game and the iniquitous hour, whose falcon soul sits fast, and not in turns her high sagacious tour, or e'er the quarry sighted, who looks past to slow much sweet from little instant sour, and in the first does always see the last. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Council of Moderation by Francis Thompson. Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk. On him the unpetitioned heavens descend, who heaven on earth proposes not for end the perilous and celestial excess taking with peace lacking with thankfulness bliss in extreme befits thee not 
until thou'rt not extreme in bliss be equal still sweets to be granted think thyself unmeet till thou have learned to hold sweet not too sweet this thing not far is he from wise in art who teacheth nor who doth from wise in heart End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. From Assumpta Maria by Francis Thompson. Read for LibriVox.org by Philip Gould. Thou needst not make new songs, but say the old. Callie. Mortals that behold a woman rising twixt the moon and sun. Who am I the heavens assume? And all am I, and I am one multitudinous ascent i dreadful as a battle arrayed for i bear you whither tend i ye are i be undismayed i the ark that for the graven tables of the law was made man's own heart was one one heaven both within my womb were laid for there anteros with eros heaven with man conjoined was twin stone of the law iskaros agios athanatos I, the flesh-girt paradises, gardenered by the Adam new, daintied o'er with sweet devices which he loveth, for he grew. I, the boundless strict savannah which God's leaping feet go through. I, the heaven whence the manna weary Israel slid on you. He, the anteros and eros. I, the body. He, the cross. He upbeareth me. Iskaros. Agios. Athanatos. I am Daniel's mystic mountain whence the mighty stone was rolled. I am the four rivers' fountain watering paradise of old. Cloud down raining the just one am, deny of the shower of gold. I the hostile of the sun am, he the lamb, and I the fold. He the enteros and eros, I the body, he the cross. He is fast to me, iskaros, agios, athanatos. I the presence hall where angels do in wheel their placid king. Even my thoughts, which without change else cyclic burn and cyclic sing. To the hollow of heaven transplanted, I a breathing Eden spring, where with venom all outpanted lies the slimed curse shriveling. For the brazen serpent clear on that old fanged knowledge shone. I to wisdom rise, Iskaron, Agion, Athanaton. Then commanded and spake to me he who framed all things that be, and my Maker entered through me, in my tent his rest took he. Lo, he standeth, spouse and brother, I to him and he to me, who upraised me where my mother fell beneath the apple tree. Risen twixt Anteros and Eros, blood and water, moon and sun, he upbears me, he Iskaros, I bear him, the Athanaton. Where is laid the Lord arisen, and the light we walk in gloom? Though the sun has burst his prison, we know not his biding room. Tell us where the Lord sojourneth, for we find an empty tomb. Whence he sprung, there he returneth, mystic sun, the virgin's womb. Hidden sun, his beam so near us, cloud and pillared as he was. From of old, there he, Iskaros, waits our search, Athanatos. Camp of angels, well we even of this thing may doubtful be, if thou art assumed to heaven, or is heaven assumed to thee. Consumatum, Christ the promise, thy maiden realm is one, O strong. Since to such sweet kingdom comest, remember me, poor thief of song. Cadent falls the stars along, mortals that behold a woman rising twixt the moon and sun. Who am I, the heavens assume, and all am I. And I am one. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. From An Anthem of Earth by Francis Thompson. Read for LibriVox.org by Nemo. From An Anthem of Earth. In Nescientness, in Nescientness. Mother, we put these fleshy lindings on, 
thou yield'st to thy poor children took thy gift of life which must in all the after days be craved again with tears with fresh and still petitionary tears being once bound thine almsmen for that gift we are bound to beggary nor our own can call the journal dole of customary life but after suit obsequious for it to thee indeed this flesh o mother a beggar's gown a client's badging we find which from thy hands we simply took not dreaming of the after penury in nescientness in a little thought in a little thought we stand and eye thee in a grave dismay with sad and doubtful questioning when first thou speakest to us as men like sons who hear newly their mother's history unthought before and say she is not as we dreamed ah me we are beguiled what art thou then that art not our conceiving art thou not too old for thy young children or perchance keepest thou a youth perpetual burnishable beyond thy sons decrepit it is long since time was first a fledgling yet thou mayest be but as a pendant bula against his stripling bosom swung alack for that we seem indeed to have slipped the world's great leaping time and come upon thy pinched and dozing days these weeds these corporal leavings thou not castest us new fresh from thy craft ship like the lily's coats but foistest us off with hasty tarnished piecings negligent snippets and waste from old ancestral wearings that have seen sorrier usage remainder flesh after our father surfeits nay with chinks some of us that if speech may have free leave our souls go out at elbows we are sad with more than our sire's heaviness and with more than their weakness weak we shall not be mighty with all their mightiness nor shall not rejoice of all their joy a mother mother what is this man thy darling kissed and cuffed thou lustingly engenderest to sweat and make his brag and rot crowned with all honour in all shamefulness from nightly towers he dogs the secret footsteps of the heavens sifts in his hands the stars weighs them as gold dust and yet he is successive unto nothing but patrimony of a little mould an entail of four planks thou hast made his mouth avid of all dominion and all mightiness all sorrow all delight all topless grandeurs all beauty and all starry majesties in dim transstellar things even that it may filled in the ending with a puff of dust confess it is enough the world left empty what that poor mouthful crams his heart is builded for pride for potency infinity all heights all deeps and all immensities arrased with purple like the house of kings to stall the gray rat and the carrion worm stately lodge mother of mysteries sayer of dark sayings and a thousand tongues who bringest forth no saying yet so dark as we ourselves thy darkest we the young in a little thought in a little thought at last confront thee and ourselves in thee and wake discarmented of glory as one on a mount standing and against him stands on the mounted verse crowned with westering rays the golden sun and they two brotherly gaze each on each he faring down to the dull veil his godhead peels from him till he can scarcely spurn the pebble for nothingness of new-found mortality 
that mutinies against his galled foot litly he sets him to the daily way with all around the valleys growing grave and known things changed and strange but he holds on though all the land of light be widowed in a little thought in a little dust in a little dust earth thou reclaim'st us who do all our lives find of thee but egyptian villainage thou dost this body this enhavocked realm subject to ancient and ancestral shadows descended passion sway it it is distraught with ghostly usurpation dinned and fretted with a still tyrannous dead a haunted tenement peopled from barrows and outworn ossuaries thou giv'st us life not half so willingly as thou undost thy giving thou that teemest the stealthy terror of the sinuous pard the lion maned with curled puissance the serpent and all fair strong beast of raven thyself most fair and potent beast of raven and thy great eaters thou the greatest eatest thou hast devoured mammoth and mastodon and many a floating bank of fangs the scaly scourges of thy primal brine and the tower crested plesiosaur thou fillest thy mouth with nations gorgeous slow on purple eons of kings man's hulking towers are carcass for thee and to modern sun disglutteth their splintered bones rabble of pharaohs and arsacidae keep their cold house within thee thou hast sucked down how many ninevehs and hecamptopyli and perish cities whose great phantasmata or brow the silent citizens of dice hast not thy fill tarry a while lean earth for thou shalt drink even till thy dull throat sicken the draught thou growest most fat on hearest thou not the world's knives bickering in their sheaths o oh, patience much awful of a foul world comes thy way and man's superfluous cloud shall soon be laid in a little blood in a little peace in a little peace thou dost rebate thy rigid purposes of imposed being and relenting mendest too much with naught the westering phoebus horse paws in the lucent dust as when he shocked the east with rising oh how may i trace in this decline that morning when we did sport twixt the claws of newly whelped existence which had not yet learned rending we did then divinely stand not knowing yet against us sentence had passed of life nor commutation petitioning into death what's he that of the free state argues tell us bid him stoop even where the low heek yaket answers him thus low o oh man there's freedom scenery tell us most reverend soul free common weal and model deeply policy there none stands on precedence nor ambitiously woos the impartial worm whose favors kiss with liberal largesse all there each is free to be e'en what he must which here did strive so much to be he could not there all do their uses just with no flown questioning to be took by the hand of equal earth they doff her livery slip to the worm which lackeys them their suits of maintenance and that soiled workaday apparel cast put on condition death's ungentle buffet alone makes ceremonial manumission so are the heavenly statues set and those uranian tables of the primal law in a little peace in a little peace like fierce beasts that a common thirst makes brothers we draw together to one hid dark lake in a little peace in a little peace we drain with all our burthens of dishonor 
into the cleansing sands o oh, the thirsty grave the fiery pomps brave exhalations and all the blistering shows o oh, the seeming world which the sight aches at we on winking see through the smoked glass of death death wherewith spined the muddy wine of life that earth doth purge of her plethora of man death that doth flush the cumbered gutters of humanity nothing of nothing king with front uncrowned whose hand holds crownets playmate swart or the strong tenebrous moon that flux and refluence draws of the high tided man skull housed asp that stings the heel of kings true fount of youth where he that dips is deathless beings drone pipe whose nostril turns to blight the shriveled stars and fix the lusty breathing of the sun pontifical death that doth the crevasse bridge to the steep in trifid god one mortal birth that broker is of immortality under this dreadful brother uterine this kinsman feared tell us behold me come thy son stern nursed whose mortal mother like to turn thy weanling's mouth averse bitterest thine over childed breast now mortal sunlight i thou hast suckled mother i at last shall sustenant be to thee here i untrammel here i pluck loose the body cementing and break the tomb of life here i shake off the burr of the world man's congregation shun and to the antique order of the dead i take the tongueless vows my cell is set here in thy bosom my little trouble is ended in a little peace end a poem this recording is in the public domain contemplation by francis thompson read for LibriVox.org by philip gould this morning saw i led the shower the earth reclining in a lull of power the heavens pursuing not their path lay stretched out naked after bath or so it seemed field water tree were still nor was there any purpose on the calm-browed hill the hill which sometimes visibly is wrought with unresting energies looked idly from the musing wood and every rock a life renewed exhaled like an unconscious thought when poets dreaming unperplexed dream that they dream of naught nature one hour appears a thing unsexed or to such serene balance brought that her twin natures cease their sweet alarms and sleep in one another's arms the sun with resting pulses seems to brood and slacken its command upon my unurged blood the river has not any care its passionless water to the sea to bear the leaves have brown content the wall to me has freshness like a scent and takes half animate the air making one life with its green moss and stain and life with all things seems too perfect blent for anything of life to be aware the very shades on hill and tree and plain where they have fallen doze and where they doze remain no hill can idler be than i no stone its inner particled vibration investeth with a stiller lie no heaven with a more urgent rest betrays the eyes that on it gaze we are too near akin that thou shouldst cheat me nature with thy fair deceit in poets floating like a water-flower upon the bosom of the glassy hour in skies that no man sees to move lurk untumultuous vortices of power for joy too native and for agitation too instant too entire for sense thereof motion like gnats when autumn suns are low perpetual as the prison feet of love on the heart's floors with painted pace that go from stones and poets you may know nothing so active is 
as that which least seems so for he that conduit running wine of song then to himself does most belong when he his mortal house unbars to the importunate and thronging feet that round our corporal walls unheeded beat till all containing he exalt his stature to the stars or stars narrow their heaven to his fleshly vault when like a city under ocean to human things he grows a desolation and is made a habitation for the fluxious universe to lave with unimpeded motion he scarcely frets the atmosphere with breathing and his body shares the immobility of rocks his heart's a drop well of tranquillity his mind more still is than the limbs of fear and yet its unperturbed velocity the spirit of the simoon mocks he round the solemn centre of his soul wheels like a dervish while his being is streamed with the set of the world's harmonies in the long draught of whatsoever sphere he lists the sweet and clear clangor of his high orbit on to roll so gracious is his heavenly grace and the bold stars does hear every one in his airy soar forevermore shout to each other from the peaks of space as thwart ravines of azure shouts the mountaineer end of poem this recording is in the public domain Correlated Greatness by Francis Thompson Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk O oh, nothing in this corporal earth of man That, to the imminent heaven of his high soul, Responds with color and with shadow, Can lack correlated greatness if the scroll where thoughts lie fast in spell of hieroglyph be mighty through its mighty habitants if god be in his name grave potence if the sounds unbind of hieratic chants all's vast that vastness means nay i affirm nature is whole in her least things expressed nor know we with what scope god builds the worm our towns are copied fragments from our breast and all man's babylons strive but to impart the grandeurs of his babylonian heart end of poem this recording is in the public domain July Fugitive by Francis Thompson, recorded for LibriVox.org by Jude. Can you tell me where has hid her pretty maid July? I would swear one day ago she passed by. I would swear that I do know the blue bliss of her eye. Tarry maid, maid, I bid her, but she hastened by. Do you know where she has hid her, May July? Yet in truth it needs must be, the flight of her is old. Yet in truth it needs must be, for her, the nest, the earth is cold. No more in the pool even, wade her rosy feet. Dawn flakes, no more plash from them, to poppies mid the wheat she has muddied the day's oozes with her petulant feet scared the clouds that floated as sea-birds they were slow on the coral lulls of the air lulled on the luminous levels of air she has chidden in a pet all her stars from her now they wander loose and sigh through the turbid blue now they wander weep and cry yeah and i too where are you sweet july where are you who hath beheld her footprints or the pathway she goes tell me wind tell me wheat which of you knows sleeps she swathed in the flushed arctic night of the rose or lie her limbs like alp glow 
on the lily snows. Gales that are all visitant find the runway, and for him who findeth her, I do charge, you say, I will throw largesse of broom of this summer's mintage. I will broach a honey bag of the bee's best vintage, breezes wheat, flowers sweet. None of them knows. How then shall we lure her back? from the way she goes for it were a shameful thing saw we not this corner ere autumn camp upon the fields red with rout of summer when the bird quits the cage we set the cage outside with seed and with water and the door wide haply we may win it so back to abide hang her cage of earth out o'er heaven's sunward wall its four gates open winds in watch by rained cars at all reloom in hanging hedgerows the rain-quenched blossom and roses sob their tears out on the gale's warm heaving bosom shake the lilies till their scent overdrip their rims that our runway may see we do know her whims sleek the tumbled waters out for her travel limbs strew and smooth blue night thereon there will oh not doubt her the lovely sleepy lady lie with all her stars about her end of poem this recording is in the public domain Any Saint by Francis Thompson, read for LibriVox.org by Phil Schimpf. His shoulder did I hold too high that I, or bold weak one, should lean thereon. But he a little hath declined his stately path, and my feet set more high, that the slack arm may reach his shoulder, and faint speech stir his unwithering hair and bolder now and bolder i lean upon that shoulder so dear he is and near and with his aureole the tresses of my soul are blent and wish content yea this too gentle lover hath flattering words to move her to pride by his sweet side ah love somewhat let be lest my humility grow weak when thou dost speak rebate thy tender suit lest to herself impute some worth thy bride of earth a maid too easily conceits herself to be those things her lover sings and being straightly wooed believes herself the good and fair he seeks in her turn something of thy look and fear me with rebuke that i may timorously take tremors in thy arms and with contrived charms allure a love unsure not to me not to me build so flawfully o god thy humbling laud not to this man but man universe in a span point of the spheres conjoint in whom eternally thou light dost focus thee didst pave the way o the wave rivet with stars the heaven for causeways to thy driven car in its coming far unto him only him in thy deific whim didst bound thy works great round in this small ring of flesh the sky's golden knotted mesh thy wrist did only twist to take him in that net man swinging wicket set between the unseen and seen lo god's two worlds immense of spirit and of sense wed in this narrow bed yea and the midge's hymn answers the seraphim athwart thy body's court great arm fellow of god to the ancestral clod kin and to cherubim bread predilectedly o oh, the worm and deity hark o oh, god's clay sealed ark to praise that fits thee clear to the ear within the ear but dense to clay sealed sense thee god's great utterance bore o oh, secret metaphor of what thou dream'st no jot cosmic metonymy weak world unshuttering key one seal of solomon 
trope that itself not scans its huge significance which tries cherubic eyes primer where the angels all god's grammars spell in small nor spell the highest too well point for the great descants of starry disputants equation of creation thou meaning couldst thou see of all which dafteth thee so plain it mocks thy pain stone of the law indeed thine own self couldst thou read thy bliss within thee is compost of heaven and mire slow foot and swift desire lo to have yes choose no gird and thou shalt unbind seek not and thou shalt find to eat deny thy meat and thou shalt be fulfilled with all sweet things unwilled so best god loves to jest with children small a freak of heavenly hide and seek fit for thy wayward wit who art thyself a thing of women wavering free when his wings pen thee so fully blessed to feel god whistle thee at heel drunk up as a dewdrop when he bends down sunwise in temperable eyes most proud when utterly bowed to feel thyself and be his dear nonentity caught beyond human thought in the thunder spout of him until thy being dim and be dead deathlessly stoop stoop for thou dost fear the nettle's wrathful spear so slight art thou of might rise for heaven hath no frown when thou to thee plucks down strong clod the neck of god end of poem this recording is in the public domain from the victorian ode read for LibriVox.org by philip gould written for the queen's golden jubilee day eighteen ninety seven lo in this day we keep the yesterdays and those great dead of the victorian line they passed they passed but cannot pass away for england feels them in her blood like wine she was their mother and she is their daughter this lady of the water and from their loins she draws the greatness which they were and still their wisdom sways their power lives in her their thews it is england that lift thy sword they are the splendor england in thy song they sit unbidden at thy council board their fame doth compass all thy coasts from wrong and in thy sinews they are strong their absence is a presence and a guest in this day's feast this living feast is also of the dead and this o england is thine all souls day and when thy cities flake the night with flames thy proudest torches yet shall be their names come hither proud and ancient east gather ye to this lady of the north and sit down with her at her solemn feast upon this culminant day of all her days for ye have heard the thunder of her goings forth and wonder of her large imperial ways let india send her turbans and japan her pictured vest from that remotest isle seated in the antechambers of the sun and let her western sisters for a while remit long envy and disunion and take in peace her hand behind the buckler of her seas gainst which their wrath is splintered come for she her hand ungauntlets in mild amity victoria queen whose name is victory whose woman's nature sorteth best with peace bid thou the cloud of war to cease which ever round thy wide-girt empery fumes like to smoke about a burning brand telling the energies which keep within the light unquenched as england's light shall be and let this day here only peaceful din for queenly woman thou art more than woman thy name the oft-struck barbarian shuns thou art the fear of england to her foemen the love of england to her sons and this thy glorious day is england's who can separate the two now unto thee the plenitude of the glories thou didst sow is garnered up in prosperous memory and for the perfect evening of thy day in untumultuous bliss serenely gay sweetened with silence of the afterglow nor does the joyous shout which all our lips give out jar on that quietude more than may do a radiant childish crew with well accordant discord fretting the soft hour whose hair is yellowed by the sinking blaze over a low-mouthed sea exult 
yet be not twirled england by gusts of mere blind and insensate lightness neither fear the vastness of thy shadow on the world if the east still strains against its leash the unglutted beast of war if yet the cannon's lip be warm thou whom these portents warn but not alarm feastest but with thine hand upon the sword as fits a warrior race not like the saxon fools of olden days with the mead dripping from the hairy mouth while all the south filled with the shaven faces of the norman horde end of poem this recording is in the public domain saint monica by francis thompson read for librivox dot org by bruce Kachuk. at the cross thy station keeping with the mournful mother weeping thou unto the sinless son weepest for thy sinful one blood and water from his side gush in thee the streams divide from thine eyes the one doth start but the other from thy heart mary for thy sinner see to her sinless mourns with thee could that son the son not heed for whom too such mothers plead so thy child had baptism twice and the whitest from thine eyes the floods lift up lift up their voice with a many watered noise down the centuries fall those sweet sobbing waters to our feet and our laden air still keeps murmur of a saint that weeps teach us but to grace our prayers such divinity of tears earth should be lustrate again with contrition of that rain till celestial floods or rise the high tops of paradise end of poem this recording is in the public domain To the Sinking Sun by Francis Thompson. Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk. How graciously thou wearest the yoke of youth that does not fail. The grasses, like the anchored smoke, ride in the bending gale. This knoll is snowed with blossomy manna and fire dropped as a seraph's mail here every eve thou stretchest out untarnishable wing and marvellously bring'st about newly an olden thing nor ever through like ordered heaven moves largely thy grave progressing here every eve thou goest down behind the selfsame hill nor ever twice alike ghost down behind the selfsame hill nor likewise is one flame-sopped flower possessed with glory past its will not twice alike i am not blind my sight is live to see and yet i do complain of thy weary variety o son i ask thee less or more change not at all or utterly o give me unprevisioned new or give to change reprieve for new in me is olden too that i for sameness grieve o flowers o grasses be but once the grass and flower of yester eve wonder and sadness are the lot of change thou yield'st mine eyes grief of vicissitude 
but not its penetrant surprise immutability mutable burthens my spirit and the skies o altered joy all joyed of yore plodding in unconned ways o grief grieved out and yet once more a dull new staled amaze i dream and all was dreamed before or dream i so the dreamer says end of poem this recording is in the public domain Dream Tryst by Francis Thompson, read for LibriVox.org by Roberto Kingsley. The breaths of kissing night and day were mingled in the eastern heaven. Throbbing with unheard melody, shook Lyra all its star chord seven. When dusk shrunk cold and light trod shy, and dawn's gray eyes were troubled gray, and souls went palely up the sky and mine to lucidae there was no change in her sweet eyes since last i saw those sweet eyes shine there was no change in her deep heart since last that deep heart knocked at mine her eyes were clear her eyes were hopes wherein did ever come and go the sparkle of the fountain drops from her sweet soul below the chambers in the house of dreams are fed with so divine an air that time's hoar wings grow young therein, and they who walk there are most fair. I joyed for me, I joyed for her, who with the past meet girt about, where our last kiss still warms the air, nor can her eyes go out. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Buona Notte by Francis Thompson Read for LibriVox.org by Emma Charlotte Jane Williams, in her last letter to Shelley, wrote, Why do you talk of never enjoying moments like the past? Are you going to join your friend Plato? Or do you expect I shall do so soon? Buona Notte that letter was dated July 6th. Shelley was drowned on the 8th. And this is his imagined reply to it from another world. Aerial to Miranda here, this good night the sea winds bear. And let thine unacquainted ear take grief for their interpreter. Good night, I have risen so high into slumber's rarity. Not a dream can beat its feather through the unsustaining ether. Let the sea winds make a vouch how thunder summoned me to couch. Tempest curtained me about and turned the sun with his own hand out. And though I toss upon my bed, my dream is not disquieted. Nay, deep I sleep upon the deep, And my eyes are wet, but I do not weep, And I fell to sleep so suddenly, That my lips are moist yet, Couldst thou see, With the good night draught I have drunk to thee, Thou canst not wipe them, for it was death, Damped my lips, that has dried my breath a little while it is not long the salt shall dry on them like the song now knowest thou that voice desolate morning ruined joy's estate reach thee through a closing gate goest thou to plato ah girl no it is to pluto that i go End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Arab Love Song by Francis Thompson 
Read for LibriVox.org by Emma Charlotte. The hunched camels of the night trouble the bright and sill the waters of the moon. The maiden of the morn will soon through heaven stray and sing. Star gathering. Now while the dark about our lovers is strewn, light of my dark, blood of my heart. O oh, come, and night will catch her breath up and be dumb. Leave thy father, leave thy mother, and thy brother. Leave the black tents of thy tribe apart. Am I not thy father, and thy brother, and thy mother, and thou? What needest with thy tribe's black tents, who hast the red pavilion of my heart? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Kingdom of God by Francis Thompson. Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. The Kingdom of God in No Strange Land. O world invisible, we view thee. O world intangible, we touch thee. O world unknowable, we know thee. Inapprehensible, we clutch thee. Does the fish soar to find the ocean? The eagle plunge to find the air? That we ask of the stars in motion if they have rumor of thee there. Not where the wheeling systems darken and our benumbed conceiving soars. The drift of pinions would we hearken, beats at our own clay-shuttered doors. The angels keep their ancient places, turn but a stone, and start a wing. Tis ye, tis your estranged faces, that miss the many-splendored thing. But when so sad thou canst not sadder cry, and upon thy so-sore loss shall shine the traffic of Jacob's ladder, pitched betwixt heaven and charring cross. Yea, in the night, my soul, my daughter, cry, Clinging heaven by the hymns, And lo, Christ walking on the water, Not of Genesareth, but Thames. Footnote. This poem, found among his papers when he died, Francis Thompson might yet have worked upon to remove, Here a defective rhyme, there an unexpected elision, But no altered mind would he have brought to its main purport and the prevision of heaven in earth and god in man pervading his earlier published verse we find here accented by poignantly local and personal allusions for in these triumphing stanzas he held in retrospect those days and nights of human dereliction he spent beside london's river and in the shadow but all radiance to him of charing cross in the footnote End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Envoy by Francis Thompson Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk Go, songs, for ended is our brief, sweet play. Go, children of swift joy and tardy sorrow and some are sung and that was yesterday and some unsung and that may be to-morrow go forth and if it be your stony way old joy can lend what newer grief must borrow and it was sweet and that was yesterday and sweet is sweet though purchased with sorrow go songs and come not back from your far way and if men ask you why ye smile and sorrow tell them ye grieve for your hearts know to-day tell them ye smile for your eyes know tomorrow. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
Section 52 of Selected Poems of Francis Thompson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Selected Poems of Francis Thompson by Francis Thompson. Appreciations of Francis Thompson. Such pronouncements proved at least that a poet who had no friends save such as his published poems gained for him, could count on an immediate recognition for high merit. For these tributes, and many more of like welcoming, placed him instantly out of range of the common casualties of criticism. From the Note on Francis Thompson As the writer of the note has not attempted a critical estimate of the poetry, some of these appreciations, forming part of the poet's life history, and even of the literary history of his time, are here reproduced. Mr. Francis Thompson is a writer whom it is impossible that any qualified judge should deny to be a new poet. And while most poets of his quality have usually to wait a quarter of a century or more for adequate recognition, this poet is pretty sure of a wide and immediate acknowledgment. We find that in these poems profound thought, far-fetched splendor of imagery, and nimble-witted discernment of those analogies which are the roots of the poet's language abound, qualities which ought to place him in the permanent ranks of fame with Cowley and Crashaw. The hound of heaven is so great and passionate in such a meter-creating motive that we are carried over all obstructions of the rhythmical current and are compelled to pronounce it at the end one of the very few great odes of which the language can boast. In a lesser degree, this meter-making passion prevails in the seven remarkable pieces called Love in Diane's Lap, poems of which Laura might have been proud, and Lucretia not ashamed, to have had addressed to her. The main region of Mr. Thompson's poetry is the inexhaustible and hitherto almost unworked mine of Catholic philosophy. Not but that he knows better than to make his religion the direct subject of any of his poems, unless it presents itself to him as a human passion, and the most human of passions, as it does, in the splendid ode just noticed, and which God's long pursuit and final conquest of the resisting soul is described in a torrent of as humanly impressive verse as was ever inspired by a natural affection. Mr. Thompson places himself by these poems in the front rank of pioneers of the movement, which, if it be not checked, as in the history of the world it has once or twice been checked before, by premature formulation, and by popular and profane perversion, must end in creating a new heaven and a new earth. Coventry Patmore in the Fortnightly Review It is not only the religious ecstasy of Crashaw that they recall, for all the daringly fantastic imagery, all the love lyrical hyperbole, all that strange mixture of artifice, of spontaneous passion, and studied conceit, which were so characteristic of the age of Crashaw, are with the same astonishing fidelity reproduced, where, unless perhaps in here and there a sonnet of Rossetti's, has this sort of sublimated enthusiasm for the bodily and spiritual beauty of womanhood found such expression as in love in Diane's lap, between the age of the Stuarts and our own. To realize the full extent to which the religious or semi-religious emotions, now ecstatic, now awe-stricken, dominate and color the entire fabric of these strange poems, they must be read throughout. In the lines of the dead cardinal of Westminster, we see them at their subtlest, and in the very powerful piece, The Hound of Heaven, a poem setting forth the pursuit of the human soul by divine grace, they are at their most intense. The minority who can recognize the essentials under the accidents of poetry, and who feel that it is to poetic form alone, and not to forms that eternity belongs, will agree that alike in wealth and dignity of imagination, in depth and subtlety of thought, and in magic and mastery of language, a new poet of the first rank is to be welcomed in the author of this volume. H. D. Trail in the 19th Century the first thing to be done, and by far the most important, is to recognize that we are here face to face with a poet of the first order, a man of imagination all compact, 
a seer and singer of rare genius he revels indeed in orgiac imageries and revelry implies excess but when excess is an excess of strength the debauch a debauch of beauty who can condemn or even regret it would we had a few more poets who could exceed in such imagery as this it is no minor caroline singer who recalls but the jacobian shakespeare the daily chronicle a volume of poetry has not appeared in queen victoria's reign more authentic in greatness of utterance than this in the rich and virile harmonies of his line in strange and lovely vision in fundamental meaning he is possibly the first of victorian poets and at least is he of none the inferior in all sobriety do we believe him of all poets to be the most celestial in vision the most august in faculty in a word a new planet has swum into the can of the watchers of the poetic skies these are big words but we have weighed them for there is that in mr francis thompson's poetry which discourages the flamboyant appreciations of the more facile impressionist and gives him pause in his ready-made enthusiasms it is patent on the first page that there is genius in this inspiration and the great note in this utterance but page after page reveals the rich and the strange and the richer and the stranger in so many original moods and noble measures that the reviewer feels the necessity of caution in nothing does thompson appear more authentically a poet than in the fact that his sense of beauty is part of his religion in this he is like shelley except that shelley's sense of beauty was his religion and lived in an atmosphere of sensuousness a sensuousness that has little of the grosser taints of earth about it indeed but which is still sensuousness therefore shelley wrote the glorious epipsychadian therefore mr thompson writes her portrait the longest and greatest poem in his book and speaking for ourselves we shall say at once that episcidian long unique in the language has at last found its parallel perhaps its peer in her portrait of this her of mr thompson's we must say that she is the significance of his book if his sense of beauty is part of his religion his religion is that of a rapt catholic to whom the very heaven with all that therein be is open and palpable his is the catholicism of profound mysticism and of the most universal temper it is perfectly safe to affirm that if mr thompson write no other line by this volume alone is as secure of remembrance as any poet of the century his vocabulary is very great mr thompson's first volume is no mere promise it is itself among the great achievements of english poetry it has reached the peak of parnassus at a bound he has actually accomplished the high thing in metaphysical poetry that dunn and crashaw only dreamed of his mysticism is infinitely more profound and significant than theirs as his imagination is more impulsive ardent and beautiful he is the great platonist of english poetry if mr thompson had never written anything after his first volume there would be but one smart poet with whom the author of her portrait could be compared for orchestral majesties of song and that one milton he is an argonaut of literature far travelled in the realms of gold and he has in a strange degree the assimilative mind we do not think we forget any of the splendid things of an english anthology when we say that the hound of heaven seems to us on the whole the most wonderful lyric in the language it fingers all the stops of the spirit and we hear now a thrilling and dolorous note of doom and now the choiring of the spheres and now the very pipes of pan but under all the still sad music of humanity it is the return of the nineteenth century to thomas a kempis j l garvin in the newcastle chronicle and in the bookman the fine frenzy and the fine line these are two root characteristics of mr thompson's really remarkable poem one has seldom seen poet more wildly abandoned to his rapture more absorbed in the trance of his ecstasy when the irresistible moment comes 
he throws himself upon his mood as a glad swimmer gives himself to the waves careless whither the strong tide carries him knowing only the wild joy of the laughing waters and the rainbow spray he shouts as it were for mere gladness in the welter of wonderful words and he dives swift and fearless to fetch his deep-sea fancies when weak men venture on these vagaries they drown but mr thompson is a strong swimmer hyperboles which in other hands had seemed merely absurd in his delight us as examples of that fine excess which is one of the most enthralling of the many enchantments of poetry indeed mr thompson must simply be crashaw born again but born greater though the conception for example of the hound of heaven the case of a sinner fleeing from the love of christ is exactly in crashaw's vein yet it was not in his power to have suggested such tremendous speed and terror of flight as whirls through every line of mr thompson's poem r le gallien in the daily chronicle a new poet and this time a major and not a minor one on the section called love and diane's lap much might be said of its extraordinary conception and workmanship the section is one long beautiful song of praise and even worship of one whom the poet calls his dear administress but surely never was woman worshipped with more utter chastity of passion whether before her portrait in youth or regarding her as a poet breaking silence or only reflecting on her wearing of a new dress the poet is so full of fine matter and so adoring in his expression of it as to bring dante himself to mind st james gazette here are dominion domination over language and a sincerity as of robert burns the epithet sublime has been sadly stained and distorted by comic writers and there is a danger in applying it in its honest light without warning this safeguard established we have to say that in our opinion mr thompson's poetry at its highest attains a sublimity unsurpassed by any victorian poet a sublimity which will stand the hideous test of extracts in her portrait a constant interchange of symbol between earthly and heavenly beauty pulses like day and night john davidson in the speaker when at the end of eighteen ninety three there appeared a little quarto volume of poems by francis thompson the english world of letters experienced an agreeable shock of surprise it was as if a rocket had been sent up into the dark night his poems have all the pomp and prodigality of imagination for which gray's frugal muse longed the spectator words and cadences must have had an intoxication for him the intoxication of the scholar and cloudy trophies were continually falling into his hands and half through them in his hurry to seize and brandish them he swung a rare incense in a censer of gold under the vault of a chapel where he had hung votive offerings when he chanted in his chapel of dreams the airs were often airs which he had learnt from crashaw and from patmore they came to life again when he used them and he made for himself a music which was part strangely familiar and part his own almost bewilderingly such reed notes and such orchestration of sound were heard nowhere else and people listened to the music entranced as by a new magic the genius of francis thompson was oriental exuberant in colour woven into elaborate patterns and went draped in old silk robes that had survived many dynasties the spectacle of him was an enchantment he passed like a wild vagabond of the mind dazzling our sight he had no message but he dropped sentences by the way cries of joy or pity love of children worship of the virgin and the saints and of those who were patron saints to him on earth his voice was heard like a wandering music which no one heeded for what it said in a strange tongue but which came troubling into the mind bringing it the solace of its old recaptured melodies arthur simons in the saturday review to read mr francis thompson's poems then is like setting sail with drake or hawkins in search of new worlds and golden spoils he has the magnificent elizabethan manner the splendour of conception the largeness of imagery 
Catherine Tynan Hinkson in The Bookman. As a matter of fact, such facts as one kisses the book to in a court of law, it was in a railway carriage on my way back to London that I first read Mr. Thompson's poem, The Mistress of Vision. But in such truth as would pass anywhere but in a court of law, it was at Cambridge, in the height of the summer term and in a fellow's garden, that the revelation first came. I thought then in my enthusiasm that no such poem had been written or attempted since Coleridge attempted and left off writing Kubla Khan. In a cooler hour, I think so yet. And were my age twenty-five or so, it would delight me to swear to it, writing to any man's drawbridge who sets his gates against it, and blowing the horn of challenge. It is verily a wonderful poem, hung like a fairy tale in middle air, a sleeping palace of beauty set in a glade in the heart of the woods of Western Maine. Surprised there and recognized with a gasp as satisfying, and summarizing a thousand youthful longings after beauty. To me also my admiration seemed too hot to last, but four or five years have me unrepentant. It seemed to me to be more likely to be a perishable joy, because I had once clutched at and seemed to grasp similar beauties in Poe. Mr. Thompson's thought, always strong, often runs into phrases of exquisite sweetness and exquisite clarity. The lines beginning, Firm is the man, and set beyond the cast of fortune's game and the iniquitous hour, are worthy to be remembered beside Daniel's epistle to the Countess of Cumberland. Sir A. Quiller Couch, Q, in the Daily News. Thompson's poetry is a wassail of orgiac imageries. He is a poet's poet, like Shelley and Blake. In order to follow him as he soars from image to image and symbol to symbol, you must have the rare wings of imagination. Thompson mixes his metaphors so wisely that they illumine each other, strange light shooting out of their weltering chaos, like the radiance of phosphorescent waves. He troubles you with sudden pictures that flash out against the blackness. This gift of dreadful vision is not found in Crashaw or in Patmore, in Dunn or in Herbert, and therefore it seems to me that Thompson is essentially more akin to Blake, Coleridge, and Rossetti than to the ecclesiastical mystics. He is a twentieth-century mystic with a seventeenth-century manner. James Douglas in the Morning Leader Great poets are obscure for two opposite reasons. Now, because they are talking about something too large for anyone to understand, and now again, because they are talking about something too small for anyone to see. Francis Thompson possessed both these affinities. He was describing the evening earth with its mist and fume and fragrance, and represented the whole as rolling upwards like a smoke. Then suddenly he called the whole ball of the earth a thurible and said that some gigantic spirit swung it slowly before God. This is the case of the image too large for comprehension. Another instance sticks in my mind of the image which is too small. In one of his poems he says that the abyss between the known and the unknown is bridged by the pontifical death. There are about ten historical and theological puns in that one word. That a priest means a pontiff, that a pontiff means a bridge-maker, that death is certainly a bridge, that death may turn out, after all, to be a reconciling priest, that at least priest and bridges both attest to the fact that one thing can get separated from another thing. These ideas, and twenty more, are all tacitly concentrated in the word pontifical. In Francis Thompson's poetry, as in the poetry of the universe, you can work infinitely out and out, and yet infinitely in and in. These two infinities are the mark of greatness. He was a great poet. G. K. Chesterton in the Illustrated London News Thompson used his large vocabulary with a boldness, and especially a recklessness, almost a frivolity in rhyme, that were worthy of Browning. On the other hand, these rugged points were, at a further view, absorbed into the total effect of beauty in a manner which Browning never achieved. For the poet, entirely free from timidity in matters of poetic form, relied not on chastity or perfection of detail, 
but on the perfervid rush of his genius which simply carried his readers over the rough places here was a large utterance large in bulk in speed and a lavish disregard of economy and yet what could not for a moment be mistaken was that the poetry was at once great and sincere the sister songs written in praise of two little sisters contain a number of lovely and most musical lines and some passages such as the seventh section of the first poem which spencer would not have disowned the times the greater a poet's message the more profound his thought the larger his range and the more exquisite his note the deeper and more incessant will be his demand upon his reader that is why the great poets have had to wait for their recognition only the few will or can cooperate at the beginning but they are the leaven and now whole masses can see the poetic purport of shelley coleridge keats and wordsworth of whom the contemporary criticism was a thing over which you laugh or cry as the mood has you those who see in mr francis thompson an authentic poet have at any rate the profound interest of watching the various stages in the making of their immortal how have the portents followed the precedent afforded by the poets just named in general very accurately we think the common attitude of critics towards them and him has been very similar in the case of shelley it is so near in its very wording as to be sometimes startling extravagances and novelties of diction a toppling over of images and obscurity of course that were dwelt upon by objectors very just objectors no doubt who busied and troubled about details lost all sense of proportion and had no ear for the great and ultimate meaning of the poet's message the note that comes most majestically from mr thompson is that of the reconciliation of the two natures and destinies of man to that literal oneness wordsworth groped in his merely kindred points of heaven and home of that oneness rossetti has the hint and coventry patmore the full vision mr thompson is the heir of the poets and he has entered fully into his inheritance he has not picked their flowers and worn them fading their seed has passed into his life and they have blossomed anew the academy no other among the younger poets so effectually proclaimed the mastery of the grand style none other had so securely occupied a position on the right side of the line which forever separates inspiration from talent poetry from agreeable verse he appeared on the scene fully equipped there were no long years of public neglect or production of volumes which lay unnoticed on the bookstalls before being cast into the dust heap the marvellous splendour of his verse volume revealed a writer of no common order with a secureness of touch a magical decoration of style and a real message behind all the pomp and glitter and dazzling display it was art not for art's sake but charged with a meaning and a name the hound of heaven was hailed by all competent critics as one of the great religious poems of this time or of any time the daily news End of section 52. End of selected poems of Francis Thompson by Francis Thompson.